Northeast Ohio Honda dealer. Siskel and Ebert review The Good Son tonight at 11.30 on TV8. From Cleveland's own 24-hour newsroom, Dave Buckle, Kelly O'Donnell, John Telich on sports, and Mark Kuntz with weather. This is Cleveland's own News Center 8. If this guy's watching Channel 8 tonight at 11, the guy who did this, what are you going to say to him? Dead man walking. I hope they get him and I hope he fries. That's all I got to say. He's a dead man walking. A message of frustration and anger that an Akron man has toward the person who murdered his sister. 35-year-old Diane Patterson, an employee at the Red Lobster restaurant in the Belden Village area, was killed shortly after closing Friday night. Her body discovered by another employee Saturday morning. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Here's what's happening. Tonight, many people in the Stark County community of Jackson Township are shocked by the gruesome murder at a familiar place. The Akron Bureau's Don Olson reports police suspect the same person who killed Friday night may be responsible for other break-ins, and police are warning businesses in the area to be on the lookout. You know, when's this violence going to stop? We just want to know. I mean, Dale Patterson and his family say that people have got to realize that violence can strike anyone at any time. The number for the Patterson family came up Friday night with the murder of Dale's sister, Diane. After a while, you get desensitized. Every day you see something like this happening, and then until it really hits home to your own family, and that it's, it makes you wake up, and then it's just got to stop. Diane's body was discovered by another Red Lobster employee at around 8.30 Saturday morning. She had been shot once in the head and stabbed in the neck. The cash drawer to the register was empty. The doors were still locked Saturday morning, making police believe that the suspect had either hid somewhere in the restaurant after closing or talked his way in through the door. But whoever murdered Diane may have struck before. The method was very similar to the August 5th robbery of this KFC in Belden Village and another restaurant robbery in North Canton. Police have released these two composite sketches describing the suspect as a white male in his late 20s between 5'9 and 5'11 with short dark brown hair and freckles around the eyes. Assuming that they are looking for one suspect, police say he's becoming more violent with each crime. They're so concerned that they're putting out crime bulletins to other businesses in the area to be extremely careful. Area businesses have already posted the flyers and are taking the warning very seriously. We'll make sure that we have extra people here and, and uh, probably police the back doors, make sure they're all locked up you know, so that anybody can come in the back doors that way. They're not. The Patterson family, in the meantime, hopes that whoever took Diane's life realizes that he not only robbed a restaurant, but robbed a family out of many years of love and joy. They're totally senseless. I mean, there was no need for it at all. Don Olson, News Center 8, Jackson Township. If you have any information at all concerning those Stark County robberies and the identity of the suspect, you're asked to please call the Jackson Township Police Department at 832-1553. That unusual shooting that sent bullets through walls and killed a Beechwood man Friday night is now being called an accident. That's the story from the man accused in the deadly shooting. The suspect, 33-year-old Lee Carter of Cleveland, was also wounded and remains hospitalized tonight. Carter tells police he and his friend were inspecting a gun when it went off by accident. A shot killed 40-year-old Curtis Franklin of Beechwood and also wounded a woman in the apartment upstairs. No charges have been filed. Cleveland homicide detectives are looking for two suspects tonight in connection with the murder of a West Side man. 31-year-old Eddie Pascal was killed yesterday after getting into a fight with another man. It happened in front of Pascal's home on West 18th Place. Homicide detectives say Pascal was working on his car in the driveway when another car came racing around the corner. An angry Pascal then went to tell the driver to slow really down. Because uh, it was about 6, 5.30 in the afternoon, and it was a Saturday afternoon. There were a lot of kids. And apparently, you know, cars have come down that area before, and they're a little bit sensitive to it. The driver of the car drove off, only to come back moments later with a gun. Homicide detectives say the suspect, who was with another man, pulled up and shot Pascal in the forehead. Police say the men were driving a maroon car. If you have any information, again, please give Cleveland police a call. While an Eastlake teenager waits to be sentenced for the hit-and-run death of a four-year-old boy, 
His mother waits to hear if she'll be the next to go on trial. As News Center 8's Lori Taylor reports, Barbara Savchuk has been accused of helping her son get a driver's license illegally. And now a city prosecutor must decide if she's to be held accountable. Alcohol at the time he operated the motor vehicle. Barbara Savchuk cried when a Lake County jury decided her boy Andy was only guilty of a misdemeanor when he ran down and killed four-year-old Vinnie Rubertino. But how lenient will the law be with her? It was almost a year ago that Barbara Savchik and her son came here to the License Bureau in North Shore Mall. Andy was applying for a temporary permit, but he needed the signature of an adult. Barbara Savchik provided it when she signed this statement saying she would be financially responsible for her son, whose license was under suspension at the time. That's what got her charged with falsification. At this point, it looks to me like uh, I, I'm having some difficulty finding that there's any real falsification here, just some misunderstandings. Willowick City Prosecutor Charles Colson says the law prevents him from discussing pending litigation. But what I learned on my own may surprise you. Sources close to the investigation tell me Andy Savchuk was given a license in error, not because of what his mother did, but because of what the state did. Savchik presented his social security card and a birth certificate in the name of Andrew Savchik to a deputy registrar. He then signed his name as he usually does. But instead of running the 18-year-old's legal name or social security number through the computer, the deputy registrar mistakenly ran the signature Andy. Because Savchik's prior suspension was in the name of Andrew, it went undetected. Savchik got the permit, and less than a month later, he got a permanent license without anyone's help. Mrs. Savchik, could we call, talk to you for a moment? No, I'm sorry. Although the woman declined to talk with me, she did say she's praying to God that the truth will one day be made public. It's the Willowick City prosecutor's duty to decide what the truth really is. Lori Taylor News Center 8, Willowick. In Washington State, two people died instantly. Four others were seriously injured after a tour bus smashed into a convoy of 20 motorcycles. The victims were all members of a Tacoma motorcycle club. The 25-foot bus careened into four of the bikes on a highway in Mount Rainier National Park. Two drivers died instantly. Four others remain hospitalized in critical condition. Conditions still critical locally for a young motorist who, by all accounts, is lucky to be alive at all after his car reportedly lost a race with a train at a Lorraine County crossing. Thomas Lochran's car was split in half by the impact. The train said to be traveling within the speed limit at 50 miles an hour. Quick action by a passing surgical nurse may have helped save Lochran's life. The cause of that huge West Side warehouse fire is still considered undetermined tonight. Damage to the building, owned in part by the Forest City Recycling Company, reached $100,000. No one was injured as flames ripped through the West 25th Street structure for several hours last night. Propane tanks stored in the warehouse presented an added obstacle for firefighters, and so did the hundreds of disposable diapers being stored there for recycling. Fire marshals will continue looking through the rubble for a cause. And there is good news tonight for a little boy who's had a very difficult year. Five-year-old Eric Alexander left the hospital today. Alexander is on the road to recovery. He was badly burned at his home in the West Indies. And when a nurse at Brentwood took photos of him during a vacation, doctors here agreed to operate for no fee. This latest hospital visit was a follow-up to a previous stay. In about two weeks, little Eric will be well enough to go back home. And coming back on New Center 8, denials from Moscow of an impending attack on the holdouts in the Parliament building. Plus, two years of self-imposed isolation are over for the crew of the Biosphere. They're coming out, and we'll have their story and more from Moscow when we return. What is Newton? Newton is digital. Newton is personal. Newton is magic. Newton is as powerful as a computer. Newton is as simple as a piece of paper. Newton is intelligent. Newton learns about you, understands you. Newton is news. Newton can receive a page. It sends faxes and soon electronic mail. Newton lets you communicate with the whole world, and if there's anything this world could use, it is more communication. They say timing is everything. Well, you know what? Yours is incredible, because here's what's happening at your Lincoln Mercury dealer right now. 
It's model year closeout. Time to make a great deal on Mercury Villager, the minivan that drives like a car. Versatile seven-passenger seating, front-wheel drive, and loads of standard features. Maybe that's why it's outselling all its import competition its first year out. If I were you, I'd stop watching television and get down to your Lincoln Mercury dealer now. Hurry. Model year closeout ends soon. When you're sidelined by a sports injury, the experts at Mount Sinai can get you back in the game. Mount Sinai Sports Medicine, part of the Mount Sinai Healthcare System. Customer Appreciation Month gives us a chance to thank our customers for being loyal all year long. Two cent copies. Gives us a chance to introduce our services to new customers. They've been going to the wrong places, maybe this is where they want to be. 49 cent fax. It's Customer Appreciation Month. We're sure you'll love it. That's why we offer these prices. Two dollars off on UPS. Those are great deals. Come in, see how we do things. We're sure you'll be back. Some of the American servicemen who never came home from Korea may have been imprisoned in the Soviet Union. For the first time, the U.S. government is confronting Moscow with a report that says hundreds of U.S. Korean war prisoners were sent to Moscow, interrogated and never returned. The evidence was presented by the State Department to Russian officials. The Clinton administration is not commenting. The Yeltsin government has said 59 Americans were interviewed but were not taken from Korea. And this was the scene in Moscow's Red Square. Tensions picked up as armed guards surrounded the Russian building called the White House. The guards are loyal to Parliament in the five-day-old standoff between Russian President Boris Yeltsin and Parliament's hardliners who want Yeltsin impeached. Tonight, reports say Yeltsin will agree to simultaneous elections for President and Parliament. 10,000 cheered Yeltsin today in the biggest demonstration of support since he disbanded Parliament. And there was a historic first in the Arizona desert today as the crew of Biosphere 2 ended a two-year experiment sealed in their mini-Earth, a record for living inside an essentially closed structure. But that wasn't the real reason for the experiment. It was to improve living conditions on Earth as well as colonizing space. Biosphere 2 has its own atmosphere, a rainforest, an ocean, a savanna, and a farm. A new crew enters Biosphere for a year in February, leaving this one to deal with critical reviews questioning the scientific value of the achievement. Well, gathering scientific data definitely was not on the mind of a daredevil who rode a homemade barrel of sorts over Niagara Falls today and lived to tell about it. Now, what's really remarkable is that this was John David Monday's second ride over the falls, the first one made eight years ago. Monday suffered only a few minor injuries. He refused hospital treatment, left unconscious by the 176-foot fall. He was rescued by the crew of the Maid of the Mist boat at the bottom of Horseshoe Falls. Boy, I know I've been up there close sometimes mm -hmm. and heard those falls roaring. Uh, never get me to do that or even think about it. I know it. And speaking of daredevils, anybody notice the fly in here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a daredevil. I should tell everybody what I was trying to do when you were when you were reading that story. And of Serious course, you know, news. we all stick up for one another. Thank here. you, Mark. I this appreciate it. This is the new Center 8 family. I was doing this <laughs> off camera, but you couldn't see me. It I helped. was trying not to rattle the It paper. helped. I thought when the weather got colder, the flies went away. Well, they're coming inside. We've got some bug bomb back here somewhere. I think maybe we should get that out after the show and get rid of these and flies. They should need umbrellas flies. this week, too, yeah. right? Anyway, our forecast is going to need an umbrella for much of this week. Well said, Kelly. It's going to seem a whole lot like the month of October is here, ladies and gentlemen. I'll share that with you. We'll try to get rid of the flies, too. All of that coming up.